Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions, brought to you by AmericanManganeseInc.com. Here is Phil Mackesy. Author, entrepreneur, and blogger Garth Turner is back on This Week in Money. Garth's latest book is Money Road, Tools for the Wild Ride Ahead. Garth's blog at greaterfool.ca. Garth, it's good to have you back. Thank you, Phil. Pleasure to be on the show. Big week in the mortgage business in Canada, Garth. Our tiny Elfin Finance Minister F killing the 30-year mortgage this week. And uh, the folks at the OSFI uh, tightened up uh, lending rules. Let's start with uh, mortgages. What's changed now? Yeah, big changes, actually. The most significant one is that... 30-year amortizations are being dropped to 25. That may sound technical, but what it means is people who take mortgages uh, have had a 30-year period over which to amortize the interest. Well, by dropping that by five years, effectively, it just raises monthly payments. And that's really the equivalent of mortgage rates increasing by about 1%. Okay. Now, if you're a first-time buyer and you don't have a lot of money, uh, obviously, uh, payments, monthly payments, they're everything. So if monthly payments are now going to be going up by an average of 12%, um, that actually makes a difference. Change number one. Change number two, uh, the government is going to require the banks to be more stringent about lending standards. So again, people will have to qualify for a, a higher hurdle in order to get a mortgage. They'll need to qualify for a five-year lending rate, which right now is 5.44%. Uh, so you may think you're going to apply for a you know, a cheap mortgage at two and a half, but actually you have to qualify for something twice as expensive. There's another change, too, that's really going to impact Vancouver, uh, and that is that mortgage insurance will no longer be available for any property selling for more than $1 million. Now, as you may know, right now there's about 2,500 homes in Vancouver alone mm. that are over a million bucks and 5 million, uh, 5,000 rather, in the lower mainland. What does that mean? It means you're going to have to have at least a 20% down payment plus closing costs to buy one of these. So that's a minimum starting point of $250,000 in cash. All of it, Phil, I think is just bad news for a real estate market in the lower mainland that's already soggy and as soggy as the weather this spring, <laughs> and actually is losing ground. So not really good news for people who have been uh, trying to speculate in the market. What's the reaction been from the industry? Of course, that they've got to be universally negative about this, I would think. Oh, well, the industry saying, oh, you know, this is nothing. Uh, it's not going to impact the market. And this, this only affects a limited number of people. It's the usual spin. Some economists are saying, oh, it's just a tap on the brakes. It's no big deal. I think it is a big deal because it comes not only on its own, but as you mentioned a few minutes ago, Phil, it comes with part, being part of a package of changes in a coordinated fashion that the government is truly trying to slow this market down. And so now we've got additional regulations from the regulator in charge of the banks. And you mentioned them a minute ago, the OSCE, it's called, the Office of the Superintendent, of financial institutions. We've known in advance that these changes are coming. Some of them have been watered down, but uh, now we're, we're, we're uh, in official territory. What kind of changes are happening yeah, here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I have been kind of warning people for a number of months that, you know, this thing's coming in one shape or another, and so we now have got it. The most important thing uh, to remember, Phil, is it happened on the same day as Flaherty made these other major changes. So, there's no element of coincidence here. Mm -hmm. This is a concerted effort. It's got to send a really clear message. So what the bank regulator has done is told the banks to be more careful about lending. Uh, it's pretty much eliminated what were called stated income loans. So in other words, if you're a self-employed business person or a commissioned salesperson, you're going to have to prove your income now to get a mortgage. You didn't have to do that before. It also significantly wipes away cash back mortgages. And lots of banks were actually handing out free down payments to first time buyers. So if they went in and got a fat mortgage, the bank would give them a bunch of cash sufficient to make the deposit so they could get 100% financing. Wow. That now is gone. There's a few other tweaks here and there, but those changes alone 
com- uh, combined with Flaherty's, I think is a big deal. The and ca- then, of course, you got the Bank of Canada weighing in as well. Mm-hmm. The cashback mortgages is something you've been uh, talking about for a long time on your blog. And, and the bottom line is that if you have no skin in the game, you are vulnerable yeah. to a correction. Exactly. It's insane. It's just, to me, it is, that cashback has made yeah. a lie of this myth that Canadian banks are prudent, buttoned down, and different from American lending institutions. Well, they may be better capitalized, but evidently they're just as stupid. <laughs> and having the cash back mortgages, I think, is the, the epitome of this. So, in other words, young couples can come along. They have no savings, no equity. They built up absolutely no net worth at all. And they can go and buy a four hundred or five hundred thousand dollar condo, uh, and the bank will actually give them the five percent down payment. The government of Canada will insure the other ninety five percent. This is a formula to create a, a real estate bubble, and that's exactly what we have gotten. And now, of course, they're trying to close the barn door after the horse is already on a flight to Rio de Janeiro. Let's talk about the horse's uh, home equity line of credit, or HELOC, and they've made changes yep. there too, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So two changes here. Uh, right now, you can borrow up to 85% of the value of your home. If you go to the bank and you've got your home paid for or whatever equity you've got, you can borrow 85% and go off and buy your new boat or go buy another condo or whatever you want. Well, that got changed initially from 85 to 80. That doesn't sound like very much. And then the bank regulator came along and dropped it down to 65%. Hmm. Now, you can still borrow 80%. But the extra 15 is going to have to be taken out in the form of a new mortgage. So that has become very much more difficult to get. And again, it's going to cut down on speculation and people using their houses as if they're bank machines. That's what caused all the problems in the States. It is. Yeah, exactly. So Uh, people taking, you know, house, house values going up, creating paper equity, and then people crystallizing that. In other words, turning paper equity into real money, and in so doing, they turn it into real debt. And when real estate prices eventually go down, of course, the debt remains, and that is causing all the problems. Interesting, Garth, and all the coverage of the uh, of the Flaherty News and the OSFI News, very few new news organizations concentrating on the uh, uh, on the, the difference in amortization, the amount that you will actually pay back to the lender, and it's frightening. The difference between 25 and 30 years is, uh, is, is startling. Yeah, it is. Uh, these longer amortizations have been a horrible idea. And let's not forget, it was the same finance minister who a few years ago brought in the 40-year amortization, mm-hmm. taking it from 25 to 40. Now they've taken it back in a series of steps, right back to 25. So it's a tacit uh, recognition that it was a monumental blunder to actually increase amortizations. And of course, the longer that you spread your debt over a number of years, the more debt you're actually going to end up paying back. So if you borrow $100,000 with a 25-year amortization, you'll end up paying about three times your debt by the time the 25 years is over. If you extend it over 40 years, uh, you'd end up paying four times your debt. Uh, So you can see that the longer the amortization, the more punishing it is in terms of interest payments. Now, the monthly payment may come down a little bit, but you're making a hell of a lot more of them. So at the end of the day, uh, you just pay so much more back. It's just not a way to build up uh, personal wealth at all. You and I always have fun with the real estate spin on this. Here's a couple from uh, Jim Murphy. He's the uh, chief executive of the the Canadian Association of Accredited Mortgage Professionals. Uh, He says the government may be doing too much tinkering with the market well you know the uh the mortgage brokers are basically hung out to dry right yeah. now these guys have been losing business right left and center um they've been at the forefront of no bunny down mortgages and probably the sleaziest tactics around have been um, provided by a number of mortgage brokers not everybody's in the same boat no. of course but a lot of them have been uh, the industry is in pretty difficult trouble one thing that you can point to to uh, underscore that one of the major banks, Bank of Commerce, has been in the mortgage business. Called They've had a company called First Line Mortgages, and they've been providing financing to mortgage brokers across the country. Well, they're shutting that business down. They couldn't even find a buyer for it over the past number of months. That gives you an indication of just how this whole situation is changing, and I think the mortgage share brokers now are, are really trying to 
scratch some kind of line in the sand. Too take, bad. Too late. Taking the long-term view, Garth, how is uh, this week's announcement going to affect uh, sentiment over the longer haul? I think it's going to add to a slowing of the economy. Uh, real estate has been forming far too much of our gross domestic product, uh, almost up there with where California was in 2005, and that ended in disaster. So we need to have less of the economy dependent on mm-hmm. the consumer uh, being infatuated with, with houses. Uh, so this will slow things down, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If we have slow economic growth, but it's steady and it's less risky and less based on debt, that's a good thing. Economic growth should be based on people making more money and the economy uh, moving ahead, not just on people borrowing more. So um, at the end of the day, Phil, it's going to be uh, a few more years of slow growth, but hopefully we're not going to have a bubble that's going to end in a U.S.-style disaster. Author, blogger, financial advisor, and entrepreneur Garth Turner is our guest. You can find Garth on the web at greaterfool.ca. Don't forget Garth's latest book, Good Read. It's called Money Road, Tools for the Wild Ride Ahead. It's going to be wild indeed. Hey, Garth, thanks for talking to us again. Pleasure as always, So Thank you. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. If you haven't been to Mike Shedlock's blog yet, just Google Mish or head on over to globaleconomicanalysis.blogspot.com. Mish, it's always good to have you here on This Week in Money. A pleasure to be back on the show. Uh, it's nice to have you. And it seems, you know, you, you and I have been talking about this for a little while, but the best way to solve the uh, problems facing the global economy, let's have a meeting. The Eurozone finance ministers meeting this week. Uh, the, there's a mini summit in Rome. Uh, it, it, the leaders of Italy, Germany, France and Spain getting together. Monday, the European Commission, the ECB and the IMF, that's the Troika, those fun loving people. Uh, they're on a fact finding trip to Athens to see if Greece needs more time. How many more? <laughs> meetings can we stand? How many more facts do they uh, need to uh, find out before they realize <laughs> that uh, Greece is bankrupt and can't possibly ever pay these things back? You know, they're, they're just stringing along Germany here, who keeps pouring cold, cold water on idea after idea for all of these, quote, theoretical discussions, yeah. unquote. Every day, it seems like, there's a new proposal that's just a euro bond rehashed idea all over again. Now, they came up with this euro bond light idea last week, saying, oh, well, let's just do euro bonds, but um, we'll only do them for three months. <laughs> 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 that, seriously, was the latest proposal. And, of course, Merkel shot that down, too, and, and I did a, a, a post courtesy of... Steen uh, Jacobson from Saxo Bank in mm-hmm. Copenhagen says uh, uh, that Merkel's misunderstood, that, that uh, German doesn't translate to other languages very well, and people just don't understand no for, for, uh, for the word no, nine, I guess. Nine? Why do, not, why do these other countries and these ECB bureaucrats, why do these people not get what Germany seems to be saying very clearly? Well, Actually, maybe they do get it. Yeah. Maybe they just don't care. Maybe okay. they don't care to get it. Look, I mean, Christine Lagarde came out today, and uh, she is saying uh, things like, oh, we need to um, uh, get the ECB more involved. We uh, uh, need a banking union. We need a fiscal union. We need all of the things that Germany said that they won't do. <laughs> and she said she, can quote, consulted several... EU institutions and it's three week evaluation but did not <laughs> did not run its recommendations by Berlin. And um, I said, of course, you know, she's showing her true colors here and and put a picture of the <laughs> French flag on my blog. Now there's a whole lot of uh, ECB bureaucrats, and they're all they're all a great deal of fun. None more fun uh, than this guy Jose Barroso, uh, who who made an idiot of himself at uh, the G20. Well, uh, Nigel Farage came out and uh, actually called her an idiot. And uh, it was quite humorous. I posted it on my yeah. blog. And, and, and this was after uh, uh, he called her a delusional idiot. So let's get that delusional word in there. <laughs> uh, saying this uh, uh, whole bailout scheme, uh, the whole thing's a giant Ponzi scheme, mm-hmm. which of course it is. And uh, uh, he attacked uh, Jose Barroso for 
for blaming this all on the United States. Let's talk about some specific countries in the EU, and the next one to fall obviously has got to be Italy. What's going on here with, with, uh, with Mr. Monti? Well, everyone is betting on Spain to be the next to fall. Um, I'm not sure. Actually, Spain might be the next one to be bailed out. Okay. But Italy is highly likely to be the first big country to just say, shuck it all and leave. And a lot of it has to do attitudes. Um, the attitude of the average Greek, for some reason, I mean, they're just scared to death to go back to their drachma probably because they've been through numerous devaluations in their history. None of them have worked out particularly well. Italy is is a little bit different. Italy, um, budget deficit is not so bad. Actually, if Italy were to um, default on its debt, it wouldn't have a budget deficit at all. Interesting. So, um, but there, there's people making noise in um uh, Italy right now. There is a, a party called the Five Star Movement that has absolutely no source of funding. It, it was started literally by a comedian, a very popular comedian in Italy, who started uh, poking fun at the socialists and was sort of, you know, banned from from uh, uh, from politics or being on TV or show uh, years ago. They say it was informal, but he's back at it now. Hmm. And uh, what he wants to do is is get people to commit to no more than two terms if they're elected, to actually state their platform, whatever it is, <laughs> to be willing to debate their platform. His own personal opinion is that Italy ought to default on its debt okay. and leave the euro. That's not part of their official platform. That's just what... Uh, uh, his personal belief is, but this party has gone from obscurity to 21 percent. Uh, 21 percent might not seem so big uh, uh, in the, the United States or Canada with our small numbers of parties, but 21 percent in Italy happens to make it the second largest wow. uh, uh, party. It is only two percentage points behind the leader. So, um, uh, this guy is making noises now, the leader of the Five Star Party, uh, B.P. Grillo, and he is saying that, well, I'll see you in Parliament in 2013. It might not take that long. The um, uh, uh, European Parliament uh, uh, is looks like it's splintering right now. Okay. There, there might easily be a vote of no confidence later on this year. And, you know, uh, if they're going to have that, in my opinion, the nanny crats better have it right now because uh, this five-star party is picking up support every day. So uh, I, I think it won't be too long before it's the number one party in Italy with no funding. Amazing. For a comedian, the guy makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't he? Well, absolutely yeah. he makes a whole <laughs> yeah. lot of sense. So does Nigel Farage. But uh, uh, right now the nanny cats, nanny crats are ignoring uh, uh, th- these people. I don't, uh, I don't know how long they will be able to do that. I, th- I think people are, are missing what's going on in France. The socialists won both houses of of French Parliament and of of course uh Hollande Francois Hollande is uh the president of France and he's a socialist so for the first time in my god 30 years or mm-hmm. something I don't know how far back this goes there's there's a uh, socialists are in complete control and this guy has come out with a platform wanting to make it more difficult companies to fire workers. Crazy. Uh, This is like truly inane because if companies can't fire workers, they won't hire them in the first place. And what business is of that is of of Monsieur Hollande's is that in the first place? Well, he's railing against the high unemployment rate. Of course, yeah, of course. it's it's over ten percent now in in France. He doesn't like it. He thinks he can improve upon that. 
by uh, making it impossible for businesses to fire anyone. Now, none of this is... Lovely, they won't hire them in the first place, as I said. Now, none of this is going over big with Merkel and and the Germans. Of course this is not going over big with Merkel and the Germans. Meanwhile, no one else is making any noises anywhere, although um, I understand from that interview from uh, Nigel Farage uh, that uh, the Netherlands is starting to make some noises, so um, I, I need to do some dicking around there, seeing what, what they're saying. I, all it takes is one country to just stand up and say, we have had enough. And, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm betting that that's going to be Italy, but I need to take a look at Netherlands and see what's going on there. We're talking to Mike Miss Shedlock here on This Week in Money. Tell me about this uh, PEW, the Pew Research uh, uh, Study, European Unity on the Rocks. Here's some very interesting numbers. What people are saying as opposed to what bureaucrats are talking about. Exactly. This was, this was, this was a great study. I think it came out in May. I don't remember the exact date. I, I've just been poring over this, and I, and I, and I put it on my blog. It was, it was a... Uh, uh, a substantial length uh, uh, PDF of all kinds of questions. They they went to each country. They asked the countries what the countries thought of each other and what the countries thought of themselves. Now, one of the more amusing things in the report <laughs> was that Greece labeled themselves the hardest workers. <laughs> Seriously, the hardest workers in all of the eurozone. Wow. Everyone else labeled Greece dead last. So it was kind of amusing uh, the opinions that the Greeks had of themselves. That little anomaly aside, um, it was, uh, and, and, and this was one more of the reasons why I think Italy might be the first to leave, mm-hmm. is, is support for the euro in Italy was the lowest anywhere. Actually, it was uh, um, like 50%. Everywhere in else, it was at least positive. And um, actually, that was how they would vote. If, if, if they actually, how people, you know, what they really thought about it, it was like 30% support for the euro in, in, in Italy. So um, the, uh, a, a very, very uh, bleak report. Actually, the support for the euro <laughs> in all of Euroland was highest. In Greece, of course, Th- these people really want to cling on to this thing. Um, um, they're so afraid, so convinced by the politicians that Armageddon is going to happen yeah. if if they go back to the drachma, and it might. How it might. However, I think they'd be better off. You know, there might be some some significant short term pain, but. Um, I think getting out under the burden of of that debt and just telling the Troika to go to hell would be worth any short-term pain. But the Greek citizens don't see it that way. On the other hand, they uh, uh, it's near unanimous that they want to rework the terms of the bailout. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was kind of funny. Barrasso and all these other people are making all these kind of promises. Yes, yes, we'll do this, we'll be that. As soon as the election, the day after the, the election, Germany came out and said, sorry, guys, we're not <laughs> reworking anything. Yeah. You know, so it'll be interesting to see uh, what the, the Greek politicians do with that. Because, you know, Merkel's not even willing to toss him a bone. Yeah. So, so what happens now in Europe? What happens now? Well, there's a lot of speculation here that Germany is bending, is soft on the edges, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, certainly the ECB has come out today. I've not had a chance to write this up on my blog yet, but uh, they're going to uh, accept from Spain, BBB rated capital. Oh, We're talking about one step above junk. Wow. And uh, so yields have sunk a lot in Spain as a result of this. I think this is going to be a very short-lived thing, and uh, they're going to head right back up. And, and, and then what is the ECB going to do? Yeah. I don't know. They keep coming out with all these temporary fixes, Nowhere along the line have they addressed 
any of the real problems. And in fact, they can't because it is politically impossible. France wants a banking union before a fiscal union. Merkel wants a fiscal union for a banking union. The uh, 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 Bundesbank says that we can't have one without the other. And the German Supreme Court says, hmm, all of this can't happen before there's a referendum. (laughs) It is mathematically impossible to tangle this four-way spread where everyone wants what they want first and someone else wants something first and the german supreme court saying wait a second guys before you can do any of it you've got to have a referendum on it it's impossible to untangle this the the uh... eurozone cannot possibly survive right now the market thinks that they've kicked the can down the road here one more time uh... i don't think the market's going to be complacent with that as it has been in the past I think it's just a matter of days before things start heading back downhill. You can follow the continuing horror story in Europe and much, much more with Mike Shedlock and his blog, globaleconomicanalysis.blogspot.com. Hey, Mitch, thanks for this. Good to talk to you. It's a pleasure to be back on the show, and uh, we'll catch you later. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Adrian Ash runs the research desk at Bullion Vault, the world's largest online investment gold service. He is online at bullionvault.com. And he joins us today from London. Adrian, it's good to have you back on This Week in Money. Hi there, Phil. It's good to be back. Nice to have you. Gold down for a fourth day in New York. Uh, yesterday, the Federal Reserve in the U.S., the uh, central bank uh, uh, on this side of the pond, extending Operation Twist. And the, the key word I seem to be seeing here in the uh, North American media, Adrian, is disappointment. Are, are you feeling the same thing in London? Is the Federal Reserve as important? over in Europe as it is in uh, in the US? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, for, for as long as everyone's waiting on the European Central Bank to finally cave in and start printing money, then I think the world is looking towards the US, which is how it has been now, you know, for 60 years. Uh, the US dollar remains the world's reserve currency. It remains the world's liquidity pump. Um, you know, being the, the, the major currency in the world is actually a pretty heavy burden for the US to wear, I think, which is why nobody else really wants to pick up the mantle. Uh, clearly, the euro is not a credible challenger mm-hmm. to the dollar's reserve status, uh, and I think, you know, given that realization over the last two years in the broader financial markets, I really get the sense that at the moment a challenger isn't wanted or needed. Most people, uh, institutional investors, seem perfectly content to run back into the dollar, uh, and I think that has certainly been weighing on gold. The gold price in euros is interesting. Uh, it's not been particularly firm over the last week or so, but you know it's interesting how it's held up compared to the dollar price. And certainly what we're seeing here at Bullion Vault is uh, continued growth in interest from Eurozone uh, investors and savers, uh, particularly from Italy, actually. Over the last couple of weeks, hmm. we've seen the, the volume of new business from Italian savers and also the amount of money that they are buying the amount of money that they're converting into gold is growing as well. Anecdotally, what they're telling us, if we speak to them on the phone, is uh, you know they're very anxious about the banking system. Now, it's always interesting to analyze uh, and fun to analyze the message that gold sends us. Obviously, the folks in Italy are sending a very clear message that they are worried, as are most folks, about fiat currencies. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think that's right. Often people will say, well, I say often, always people say, you know, gold is about inflation. And I think that is absolutely true. It is, you know, the fear of inflation that drives people to buy gold. However, in a situation such as we've got now, I think what the imminent cause is, you know, the kind of uh, the gut level case for gold right now for private wealth is actually the fear of default. Um, uh, Here at Bullion Vault over the last five, six years, really since the financial crisis came into view and then developed, we've had a steady uptrend in new users worldwide uh, and in their holdings. We recently went through 30 tons of gold belonging to our customers. It's about a billion and a half dollars worth of bullion now. Um, But what's interesting with that steady uptrend is it's been punctuated by very sharp spikes at moments of extreme financial stress. And those moments of financial stress have not been inflationary. They've been effectively deflationary events. Um, So Northern Rock, the banking run here Mm -hmm. in the UK back in 2007, sharp spike in new customers. Following March, Bear Stearns, sharp spike. Obviously that autumn, that fall, we then had Lehman Brothers, AIG, etc. Um, you know, and that you know, that was a default. You know, it's basically a, a large credit institution that ceased to exist. Uh, and that, and that was a phenomenally 
strong period for gold demand. However, the price was falling, and I think you know the the, uh, the analogy with what we've been seeing over the last six to nine months is is it holds very well. That whilst the price has not been pushing higher, uh, people have continued to move into gold. Uh, existing owners have continued to add to their holdings, and I think that's because it's whilst buying gold puts you on price risk. Obviously, what it does do is get you off credit risk. And when you think about most financial products, particularly those packaged products which are available to retail savers, retail investors mm -hmm. in the West, they all come down to credit risk. Somebody owes you. If you think of a bank, you know, a bank deposit account, uh, for every creditor, there's a debtor on the other side who has to repay the bank the loan that they've taken out using the money which has been deposited. So, you know, the risk of default, the risk of an absolute loss of value, I think, is what's continuing to drive uh, private investor demand for gold in the rich West. Markets seem to be uh, anticipating that the Fed was going to do a huge quantitative easing this time around. And, and that, I guess that's where the disappointment comes in. Are, are we getting set up for QE3? And what about the European Central Bank? Is there more quantitative easing uh, coming in Europe as well? I think, you know, over, with Operation Twist, it's more you know, kind of case of Oliver Twist. You know, it's please, sir, can we have some more? <laughs> I think that's true across all the financial markets. You're seeing it today in the U.S. stock market. You know, it's, uh, obviously there's poor data come out of China, also Germany now, which seems to have and the rest of the eurozone in uh, manufacturing activity is shrinking, um, and I think you know it's, people are anticipating more monetary stimulus. Central bankers, though, uh, in the developed world, certainly, uh, and this is you know to a man, they have said in the last six months they've all made speeches. It's almost as if they got together and decided what the party line would be, which is we've done our bit. We're now waiting on the fiscal authorities. We're waiting, waiting on fiscal policymakers to sort this mess out. Uh, ben Bernanke has said this. Mario Draghi at the ECB has said it. Mervyn King at the Bank of England has said it. Um, Shirakara at the Bank of Japan has said this. You know, they've all, you know, and, and so they've also all used the analogy of saying, well, you know, we've built a bridge of easy money, which is, you know, providing a stopgap for mm -hmm. policymakers, fiscal policymakers to get things in order. And I think at the moment, the ECB is still going to sit on its hands relatively. We know that they are creating an awful lot of money uh, and lending it out cheaply to the banks. That's, you know, that's still there. The Bank of England is now easing its credit terms and is looking to extend credit to, directly to business in the UK rather than just buying government gilt. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it's not the kind of big bazookas that people have been looking for in the financial markets. Um, I don't think QE3 personally, I don't think we're going to see unless the jobs data in the States really starts to deteriorate, I don't think we're going to see QE3 this side of the election because I think politically the Fed and Ben Bernanke in particular have become a target for uh, the Republican Party in terms of, you know, easy money got us into this mess and that easy money won't get us out. And uh, so I don't personally see that QE3 uh, to any, you know, to a great size is actually going to come through this side of the election. We're talking to Adrian Ash from Bullion Vault here on This Week in Money. Pile of U.S. economic data today, in addition to the uh, bad news out of China, jobless claims, manufacturing, home sales, leading economic indicators, mostly negative. And uh, that's kind of taken away uh, attention from the real uh, uh, news here, which is the uh, the EU debt crisis, which I guess, Adrian, has been postponed this week for the uh, for the G20 meetings and the uh, and the finance summit. But I guess it'll be back next week, right? It's not going away. No. <laughs> I mean, you know, the crisis is, you know, where are we now? This is two, two and a half years. I think it was May 2010 that the first final summit to resolve all of this was actually held. Uh, and, I mean, we've tried to keep on top of the story, but, uh, you know, we've lost count of how many final summits to resolve everything there have been since then. Rumours today are that Herman van Rompuy, uh, President of the European Union, he's got a plan. Uh, Angela Merkel has already basically said that, you know, the bits of the plan that she might have seen, she's not interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so you're left with exactly the same impasse that you've basically had for the last two years now. Uh, Germany is increasingly looking like the odd man out on this. Um, you know, you've had comments from Austrian central bankers, you've had comments from across the Eurozone in the last week that something does actually have to be done uh, with regards to cheap money from the ECB and with regards to, you know, a, a fiscal union where Germany will lend its credit rating to weaker states. Now, if you look back at the history of how the Eurozone was developed as a, as a single currency, what they failed to put in place were those kind of things which would now enable the crisis to, to be resolved or even the crisis not to have developed, which would, which would be monetary transfers 
from stronger states to weaker states, such as the United States has. You know, if, uh, by having a centralized government in Washington, that's, you know, that's what's been enabled mm-hmm. in an economy which is of a very similar size to the Eurozone. Um, but all that was put in place was the monetary union. So the reason for that, I think, is quite interesting. It's, you know, back early 90s, 1992, when the Maastricht Treaty was, was first put out, there was a danger, I think, perceived in Brussels, that if they actually addressed the issue of a potential crisis, such as we've got now, then people wouldn't have gone ahead with union. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was politically impossible to talk about, you know, addressing a crisis because of course there would never be one uh you know this monetary union was going to was just going to work all fine uh, so there was no need to address it and and that would have been playing into the hands of the euro skeptics uh to have even suggested that you know sure. such a problem might need to be looked at so you now have you know uh, a monetary union which which only has half the institutions that it needs it only has a central bank and the central bank doesn't have a mandate to actually print money and hand it to governments i mean there are all sorts of uh treaty rules that actually need to be addressed and changed or bulldozed if the ecb is to hand money directly to governments so so the crisis none of these things have been addressed yet in the last two years so i think you're exactly right phil it's it's been put on hold until the g20 you know <laughs> until the next euro summit next week but then again, what is going to be, what's going to come out of that? Um, increasingly now, I think the Greece situation is is just one of waiting for the you know for somebody to say right, I'm going to lead the country out of the euro. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the vote that we saw in Athens last week, the the national election there, really just postponed that again, because the austerity as it's perceived on the ground is you know is hurting so badly now. You know the moral argument, if you like for forcing Greek citizens to continue servicing the debts which have been built up starts to look very difficult. European crisis continues, Adrian, and that's obviously got to be good for gold. What what do you see happening as far as gold in the next little while? What's uh, what's the what's the lack of action in Europe going to do to gold? As we said a moment ago, Phil, the thing with gold at the moment, and I think you know, if you look back over the over the five years of the financial crisis, obviously the price has gone higher, mm-hmm. and I think definitely QE uh, and the, the easy monetary policy across the Western world that we've had has has been a function of that, um, but. As I say, it's been, in terms of demand for Western investors, it's been driven by fear of default, I think, more than inflation. And in the absence of monetary inflation in the States, you know, a big dose of QE, I do wonder whether actually you're going to see the kind of pop that the gold futures market can deliver. The derivatives market where people are trading, you know, professional speculators are trading on margin. Um, I do wonder whether, you know, that's still missing. We've seen a little turnaround in the net long position of speculators on the COMEX. But, uh, you know, we're down at levels of, what, one-third where they were 12 months ago. So you've had a lot of hot air come out of the market there as a result of what is effectively credit deflation, I think, because of, you know, the monetary tightening, which is happening naturally. This is a credit crunch. So banks aren't so eager to lend. Speculators aren't so willing to borrow to, you know, take on new positions. So, you know, I do think pending QE3 that, you know, that's what an awful lot of the market is looking for and will continue. And until we get it, and I think we will in due course, okay. uh, you might actually see the price uh, be subdued. I don't think we're going to see, you know, a huge run up in the gold price until that monetary inflation comes through. But I don't think that's going to mean any slowdown in the rate of demand. Because as I say, what people are buying gold for now is to get themselves off credit risk. Speaking of credit risk, we uh, have some European banking news uh, today. Results of that audit of Spain's banks uh, due to be released a little later on today, expected to show they need around $80 billion to recapitalize their banks. And uh, here's Moody's in the news again, setting to downgrade some British banks. Some of the names they're bandying around Barclays, HSBC and Royal Bank of Scotland. So the European banking sector not in good shape. No, ex- exactly. I mean, you know, so much of the crisis uh, in the UK is very much homegrown, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's it's the banking crisis I know best. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's very much our own domestic problem, particularly in commercial property in the UK. Uh, I mean, what we haven't experienced in the UK yet is a sharp acceleration in unemployment. Um, what companies have tended to do in the UK over the last three, four, five years now is actually retain staff, but without any pay growth. So real incomes have fallen quite substantially. Um, the Bank of England's policy solution to this 
remains that they want to depreciate the pound. Uh, Mervyn King, Bank of England governor, repeated that just this week. He said, you know, this is this remains our strategy is to devalue the pound. It's worked for Great Britain as a as a short term fix many times, though, you know, since the, since the Second World War. Um, but, of course, the problem now is that everybody else is trying to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, obviously, the Eurozone, there's only Germany who doesn't want a weakened Euro. Uh, and I wonder whether that will change sooner rather than later as well, because, of course, as German exports start to slow down, because Germany's largest export markets are, of course, its Eurozone partners, then, you know, how does it look to grow its markets outside of the currency union? Well, then it will want a weaker a week euro. You'll remember, Phil, it's only two, three years ago that Eurozone politicians were complaining about the strong euro. Uh, well, they don't have such a strong yeah. euro now. No. And now they're complaining about that as well. Yeah. So, you know, currency remains, uh, I think, the root of a lot of speculative activity. And again, as we saw with the Fed's announcements on Wednesday, um, so much financial activity now, financial investment trading, is based around a speculation on monetary policy. Mm-hmm. What will the central banks do next, and when will they do it? Adrian, we have a couple of minutes left. Give me a th- quick thumbnail sketch of what you do at Bullion Vault and how it works. Well, Bullion Vault is an exchange. It's a live online market for private retail investors where you can buy and sell physical gold and silver. Uh, it's live online, as I say. The gold and silver is vaulted in professional uh, good delivery market accredited vaults. You can choose from London, New York, and Zurich. Zurich is the most popular. It's about 75% of client gold property is stored in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, And that's where the gold sits. It doesn't go anywhere. So when you transact on bullion vault, there's actually no friction. So our aim is to be the lowest cost, most secure provider of physical bullion for private ownership. Um, The gold sits where it is. The cash from the buyer is sitting in a segregated client's account. Uh, And so the two just change ownership. There's no actual movement. So it's very low friction on that score. As I said earlier, our customers are now now holding 30 tons of physical gold. They've got just over 300 tons of physical silver as well. So we're now the largest gold and silver provider online. Um, And, you know, we continue to see growth from the Eurozone right now. Um, Interest from the U.S. is steady. Interest from the U.K. has actually slowed down a little bit, I would say. I think, you know, we don't have an imminent crisis here right now. And I keep going back to this. It's, it's, you know, an imminent sense of crisis that really drives people to buy gold. I Mm -hmm. think this bull market has been very much about wanting to be off credit risk, to know that you own physical, tangible property, and also to know that it's liquid. And, of course, you know, as opposed to having, say, coins or small bars kept at home or in a safe deposit box at the bank, by having physical bullion, inside the accredited professional market system, which is where our customers hold theirs, you do have the whole liquidity of the London bullion market, which is where the whole the wholesale market is still centered worldwide. You have that on tap. So you're getting direct access to wholesale pricing, you're getting very low commissions, and very cost-effective storage fees as well. So it, it's a very simple business that we do. Um, and really, you know, we're not innovating here in custody. We're not trying to do anything clever with mm-hmm. how stuff is stored. That's been developed over two, two and a half centuries now in the London bullion market about, you know, the best way to care for um, accredited professional grade gold. What we innovate in here is the IT that enables you to then trade and transact okay. with one of our other 40,000 users from 150 countries worldwide live online. Adrian Ash runs the research desk at Bullion Vault, the world's largest online investment gold service, and he's online at bullionvault.com. Adrian, thanks for this. Thanks very much, Phil. Thanks to our guests, Garth Turner, Mike Shedlock, and Adrian Ash. And thanks to you for listening. I'm Phil Mackesy for AmericanManganeseInc.com. We're back next week with another edition of This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.